Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 37 of Big League Flicks, a sports movie podcast. I'm Jamie McKinman, and as always, I'm joined by my co-hosts, Christian Webster and Jordan Reed. How are we tonight, boys? Hey, boys. How are we doing? Good to be here. Another nice uh, night. We're uh, probably, this might be the last time we do this uh, a la Skype. Uh, now that we got some uh, some shots and some arms and things start to be opening up here, maybe uh, a Raj episode next week. We'll see. Yeah, Happy to be here, though. What's going on, JR? Well, look at our wounds from the Leaf game last night. So, you know, we'll be back tomorrow night. Don't worry. Be fine. Leaf fans, don't panic yet. Okay, Toronto newspaper media, just take it easy and take a breath. We'll be fine. Uh, great to be here, everybody. Yeah, like Webb said, beautiful day here today. A real proper summer day today. So, uh, can't, yeah, getting needles and arms and looking forward to uh, getting back together, James. Yeah, I'm excited. Got my uh, got my shot today. I think I was the last one of the group here to get a uh, get the shot done. Nice to get that out of the way, and looking forward to the next one. And looking forward to golf is opening up now, so we've got golf season opens up tomorrow. And I think Cleo Cleo wants to go hit the old driving range up, and we might do that tomorrow. There nice. you go. Oh. We got a game. I got a game Sunday, so we'll see how that goes. Nice. Hey, uh, on that note, uh, Leaf Nation. The social media posts I have talking about Corey Perry being a cheap shit, cheap shot artist. Come on, like seriously, total accent. Get get yeah. right, get just get right with your head. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Completely I unnecessary fight there too, and it sucks that JT's down, but you know I'm glad to hear he's out of the hospital. He's doing all right he's on the mend. Get things yep. back on the next night and and move forward. Absolutely. So this, this week. We are jumping into our fringe, as, as Webb likes to call them, fringe movies. And we're going with an Academy Award winning classic with uh, a 1986 The Color of Money, Martin Scorsese movie. So let's jump into the trailer. Paul Newman, Tom Cruise, in a Martin Scorsese picture. He's got the eye, he's got the stroke, he's got the flake. This is the best. We got a racehorse here, a thoroughbred. You make him feel good, I teach him how to run. I'm not your daddy, I'm not your boyfriend, so don't be playing games with me. I'm your partner. I love this. I made money. I lost money. No, I, I, made all come I got half of me that says I got a hold of the best thing that I ever seen, and half of me that says it just ain't worth it. Why'd you take a walk? Five hundred bucks says you choked right now. You used me. Yes, I did. Now I'm gonna leave. Ah. This is fair, said he fell some. Who the hell are you? Twenty-five years ago, I won my share of medals. It was over for me before it really got started. I'm hungry again. See some heavy legend action. I won his best game. You want my game? You couldn't deal with my game, Jack. You're outmanned. I'm gonna beat him, you know. What makes you so sure? Touchstone Pictures presents... You smell what I smell? Smoke? Money. The Color of Money. Well, every week, as you know, I like to crack a beer before we get into it. So without further ado, let's get into our brew review. Beer, yeah, beer, yeah. Oh, they fight for me, okay? Beer. Ice cold beer! Ice cold beer, yeah! What are we drinking tonight, Webb? Well, boys, uh, no formal brew review this week because unless you been living under a rock and have never turned a television on you've probably heard of the king of beers they spend a ton of money every year doing a great super bowl ad usually has some clydesdales in it sometimes an adorable little puppy uh jr gets a little teary-eyed of those ones uh but like uh, you know they make a pretty good beer i know we're all going to kind of share our stories and there's a reason behind this that i know jamer really wants to get into so i'm not going to mow his grass here but uh 
yeah, we're drinking the Budweiser King of Beers. I mean, it speaks for itself. I'm not going to, I'm not going to give you any, do it any justice. That's for sure. Check them out wherever you find them online and uh, yeah, check them out on all social media too. I'm sure they got some kind of great giveaway going on right now. Cheers. Cheers. Into it. So I'll tell a little story about the, so one of the reasons, well, the reason we picked uh, Budweiser tonight, Bud Heavies, is uh, I, I don't know if you guys had a chance to read Paul Newman's biography. I, I read, I've got that book. It's, he's awesome. I love Paul Newman. He's one of my favorite actors of all time. He's just an amazing guy, classy guy. Um, one of the things, you know his uh, Newman's own, like his Newman's own line of like salad dressings, salad dressings. And all that stuff? So the reason that that even started was because he was so finicky about what he would eat and he was really finicky about salad dressing and stuff like that. So every time they'd go to a nice restaurant somewhere, he would he'd order a salad, but he'd want to make his own dressing. So he'd go into the kitchen and whip his own dressing up. And while he was in there, like his wife would be like, where's Paul? Where's Paul? And they would literally they'd, like one of the people that are sitting at the table would have to go in the kitchen and he'd be sitting back there with like the cooks and stuff. Like hanging out with them, like drinking beers, and just having he 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 wanted to spend time with like wherever he'd go. He didn't want to be like in the limelight, hanging out with like the heidi tidy people. He wanted to be in the back, hanging out with the kitchen guys. And we've seen that with with some of the some other people over the years, right? Like there's some some guys that are just like that. Uh, but one of the, the cool things on this movie set, uh, and and this this beer, Bud Heavy, is Paul Newman's favorite beer of choice back in the day. Uh, and he's an avid beer drinker, or he was an avid beer drinker. Um, but what happened on the... So they had a lot of extras, especially in those scenes when they were in, like, Atlantic City or whatever in this movie. So mm -hmm. one thing that Paul Newman did every day whenever they had had to shoot a bunch of scenes like that is he would order in tons of cases of Bud of uh, Budweiser. And after they'd wrap up shooting for the day, he would get, have them bring all the cases in, and he would just sit around having beers with the extras for hours after, after the, the day was over. So that was pretty boy. cool. Yeah, boy. Just, just an awesome guy. We want to give a, a nice nod to uh, Paul Newman, RIP, our guy, uh, by drinking a few buds with him tonight as we review yeah. this movie. Salt of the earth, Jamer. Salt of the Absolutely. earth. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Love, love him. So as we mentioned tonight, we're doing The Color of Money, which was directed by Martin Scorsese, uh, distributed in 1986 by Buena Vista Distribu uh, Distribution. Got a 7.0 rating on Internet Movie Database and had an 89% on Rotten Tomatoes. Had a budget of $13.8 million and grossed $52.3 million at the box office. Music by Robbie Robertson, starring Paul Newman, Tom Cruise, and Mary Elizabeth Mastrantonio. Quick movie synopsis. Former billiard hustler Fast Eddie Felsen, still battling demons from his past, discovers a cocky yet talented youngster in Vincent Loria, and takes him under his wing to teach him the art of pool hustling. Eddie sees in Vincent a younger version of himself and tries to right the wrongs of his past. Through this journey, Eddie authors an unlikely comeback of his own. So let's jump into our character review, and let's start with Fast Eddie Felsen, played by Paul Newman. Oh, wow. Starting off with a legend like Paul Newman and Fast Eddie. Um... First of all, there's a couple of things I wanted to say, and, and it is, you know, in this era in the mid-'80s, Tom Cruise in his heyday, you met your match right now in Paul Newman. I love uh, this character because this is it's a Tom Cruise heyday movie, basically. Right, boys? Yep. So, uh, first of all, there's a lot. Obviously, like I like to talk about the layers to him, but, man, this guy just exudes cool. There's everything about him from his car to his look to his glasses to his jackets. Paul Newman always rocks great jackets in movies. If you watch some of his movies, he's always in good clothes. Slap shot. Slap, Slap shot. Oh, I have it in mind. The whole time I was watching this, I was still thinking of Reggie a lot. Uh, I saw some of the slap shot moves with the, I'll leave with her in two minutes. I was like, that's from Slap shot back in the day. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> I love go dancing with the aces. I just thought of him right away. Oh, it just, I loved this character. Um, I thought the, <clears throat> on another end of him, uh, the manipulation that this guy would play, the games he was playing all the time, and he was a schemer. This guy was a hustler, and he was a schemer all the time. And be, whether it be the liquor business, the whiskey business, or his idea of billiards, and when the whiskey got boring, he got moved back to billiards. Um, the game, he just, whatever the game is in this instance, the game within the game, basically, you started to learn about that in pool. And I never really thought about that, because my billiards knowledge is basically limit, limited to... Uh, in Canada, TSN Snooker Saturdays with Stephen Henry. 
So <laughs> there's this wow. one guy who knew oh, like wow. he dominated snooker. That's all I knew of the guy. But he, you started to see the hustling game within the hustling game and how he was a teacher to Tom Cruise, uh, to Vincent, sorry, about how this is how you get the most out of this. You don't just walk in and start to layer it up. You start to work the room. And he taught him how to work the room and, and the psychology behind being a hustler. I thought he was pretty neat. Was he perfect? No, he was not. And Paul Newman did a really good job of having that happen. And you could see, you know, he's fighting his demons. He at times didn't like himself. And I think the movie was better showing weaknesses within him. Because at the start, you're like, this guy's just perfect. And then eventually, you're like, no, you do a good job showing that this guy has his flaws. Whether he can't see, whether he gets hustled himself. It was a forced, uh, forced, um, Forrest Whitaker. Forrest Whitaker. Sorry. Thanks, Webb. Uh, hustling. I mean, you start to see a little bit of that. And I liked that part. That was one of my favorite parts of the movie was watching his character have some humility to him and that he's not, you know, it can happen to me too. And it happened. And you kind of see the breakdown of him. So Webb, I overall, Paul Newman, yeah, he's like a heroic character to me too uh, as a person. But this character, I really enjoyed Webb. That's the cool thing about this particular character, right? And I mean, all all hustlers at the heart of them themselves, right? They have this fake affront about how overly confident and overly, um, I'll say, opportunistic they are. Manipulative, use those words. But like at the end of the day, they're very, very insecure people at the at the heart of it, and so they they have all this as as uh, uh, as a shield to kind of keep the the real world out from knowing all their flaws and insecurities. And I think Paul Newman, because he just exudes so much cool all the time in every movie he's ever done, he's pretty cool that way. Um, it was really, really, I'll say, refreshing for him to play this role and show that kind of softer, insecure. Like the relationship he has with with the uh, the girlfriend, and her name is escaping me right now. Jay Marie will know in a sec here, but um, Janelle. Janelle. Janelle, thank yeah, you. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Like, just like, there's a genuine tenderness there uh, where you're you're like, okay, like I get this. Like this is actually his anchor and he's like, yeah, he's a bit of a, you know, he likes to come across as uh, a, a bit of bravado and his puff in his chest out around her. But at the end of the day, like he actually does genuinely give a shit about what she thinks of him. Um, and, and, and even with Vincent, as he, that relationship uh, goes on, like, yes, he wants to tutor him and yes, he feels good, but he, he, you see when he, you know, when he actually finds out that Vincent dumps the game to him, just how like his insecurities all creep back in. He's like, wait, what the fuck? Like, I didn't actually win that. Like, you can just yeah. see it eats at him. It kills him. Right. So, I mean, that's, that's something about this character I really, really enjoyed. And it's what makes him redeemable and relatable at the same time as an actual human being. Cause otherwise he'd just be a prick to be quite honest. And I, and I don't think you would have any real respect for him period, but um, the fact that he does have those insecurities and you, and we do get to see that, that's something that's really, really cool. And I mean, I think that's pretty typical of a, of a Scorsese type character. Yeah, absolutely. And the cool thing about this movie and this character that I really liked is, uh, and I'm not sure if you guys have had a chance to see The Hustler, a uh, 1961 movie with Paul Newman and uh, Jackie Gleason. Anyway, no. it's a, it's a, this movie here, The Color of Money, is an unofficial sequel to that movie. Because in the movie, The Hustler, Paul Newman plays Fast Eddie Felsen. And he's a young mm -hmm. guy, and he's, uh, he's kind of like Vincent, in a way, where he's kind of wet behind the ears. Um, you know, he's got an unscrupulous guy who's his stake horse, so to speak. And he's learning some hard lessons along the way, and he's kind of getting batted around in this game of you know high stakes hustling where you know he's, he's he's everybody's pawn and and he's kind of fighting against the system in it and he may he's making bad decisions and he, you know people that are close to him are getting hurt and and everything else so knowing that like if it's you don't have to watch that movie to appreciate this movie but it does help you kind of see some of the in uh the nuances in this movie where you're like you can see where some of the scars are on Eddie, uh, where he's where he's coming from, why he's trying to teach uh, Vincent some things, but also where he's getting away from himself as well because of a past, you know, like some of those demons that are creeping up on him. Mm -hmm. So uh, I thought they did a really good job of uh, 
of kind of tying that together, but also keeping it separate in the sense that this is its own movie. It, it's not officially a sequel of that movie, but if you want to, if you want to, if you've seen it, then you, you get some of the inside kind of not inside jokes. Some loose, there. there's some loose connections. Yeah, absolutely. And like, that was the thing with this one. And I, I don't know, like, cause I hadn't seen it also like, I don't know, JR, you were joking about the possible date you saw it or whatever. And yeah. I have no idea. I mean, I, I'll say I was in, I think I was like in my teens and I was flipping through one of those movie network channels and it probably just, mm -hmm. I just like, Oh, there's Tom Cruise. Oh, there's Paul Newman. Hey, I'll just check this out. Not knowing what the hell it right. was. Yeah. So watching it again, I didn't really remember it. And the whole time I just remember sitting thinking to myself, like when he gets to Atlantic city, which was a weird transition in and of itself about how he gets there. But yeah. uh, when he gets there, I just kept thinking to myself, like he's going to somehow get hooked up with like the mob that he owed money to or something in the first, in that first chapter of his life that we don't really know. And like, I kept waiting for that to happen. Then I was like, Oh wait, yeah, it doesn't actually happen, but it felt like it should, if that makes any sense. Like an yeah. overarching kind of thing. Like well, there's really like, he just either. talks about like how he got into some yeah. trouble in his previous. And I, I assume in like, when I hear that as somebody like, I just, I mean, maybe it's cause it's Scorsese. You think like some kind of like he owes some kind of bookie money or something like, you know, he lost somebody in a, a wreck because he was getting chased by bookies or something. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Some kind of storyline no. like that. Oh, absolutely. And the, and the good thing about the cool thing about Paul Newman is he, he was always drawn to characters that were unscrupulous, edgy, those types of characters in his, in his, that's all he always wanted to play complicated characters that, you know, aren't typically likable, but you find a way to make them likable. And he, he was one of the best, I think that, in all of film history of taking a character that if you, if you read the book and, and read this character on paper, you'd be like, I don't like this guy. But when you watch the movie and Newman's playing him, you're like, I'm not supposed to like this guy, but I love him. Like I'm yeah. rooting for him. You know what I mean? Like he could, he had the, and, and this was one of the first movies I can think of where you actually do like this character. There's a lot to like about him. He's not one of those guys you're supposed to hate. There's things about him where you're like, that's kind of grimy, but you know what I mean? Like he was he was a guy that you should be rooting for from the beginning in this one. And but I mean, at Paul Newman, he's just he's just like another guy. He's like he's he's just an art of the uh, it, 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 it's his craft. He's he's so talented. It's That's the swagger of Paul Newman, Jamer. Yeah, absolutely. That's the he, swagger. A, he brings it. He won an Academy Award for best actor for this movie in this role. So, pretty cool yeah. stuff. Let's move on to uh, Vincent Loria, played by Tom Cruise. Man, I don't know. He, at the peak of Tom Cruise's time, so we're talking, what, 1986 here? Tom Cruise is, you know, he's Maverick. He's This is he's one just, year after Top Gun. So, like, he's played beach volleyball with Slider and Iceman already. He, uh, I saw a lot of... <laughs> I saw Best a sports lot. He's gone over and under on. He's gone the, the over and under uh, high five with uh, Goose already. On this. Yeah. <laughs> Best, Maybe Goose took his shirt sports, off. Again. <laughs> Best sports movie or best sports scene that's not actually in a sports movie. Got to be volleyball. Scene. Oh, I absolutely! Be. Playing with the boys. And, yeah. and, and if that you, is, listeners, if you it. haven't been able to check it out, check out a guy on Twitter. His name is Mark. Um, uh, gosh, Mike, Mike. Camelang. Camerlingo, Mike Camerlingo, check him out. We we do retweet a lot of his stuff. He is priceless. He takes these scenes, these like two minute clips, uh, or sixty second clips, or whatever they are. He does voiceovers on them, and literally you'll like fall out of your chair, like pissing your pants, laughing at at his his voiceovers. He does the Top Gun <laughs> volleyball scene, and I was like crying. I was laughing so hard. Anyway. Sorry, yeah, I, no, it's all true. I, I, that's who I had in my head the whole time. You know how many, like, I, you know, cocktails a couple of years later, but we're right in this window of the Tom Cruise man rocket era where you're like, holy cow. And, like, the smile, the look, the eyes, the hair, the whole body, like, language, the facial reactions. I saw so much. The 0 to 60 and like that. Yeah, the 0 to 60 and all that like that. But at the same time, boys, I hated this guy. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I wanted. There's no way this guy makes it out of a pool hall alive. Whether it's MJ's in Kingston or Booker World right. in Charlottetown, I don't care. Racks in West End. I don't care. This guy, Dooley's out east. This guy is not making it out of a Dooley's out east in a million years. Whatever pool you're in, 
Man, Drew is in Toronto, Nova Scotia. Nothing wrong with Toronto, Nova Scotia. Shout out to Earl. I got kicked out of that place. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I can't see him making it out of a pool hall with all this nonsense. He drove me insane the whole time. I wanted him to fail more than you can possibly believe. I love Tom Cruise and the job he did. Don't get me wrong. Great job. Yeah. But the character, I could not stand anything about him. I don't know. You guys might be different. I, I, I loathed him. I'll use the word loathe. I loathed this character the whole time. He never, like, the juvenile he was, the video games he was playing... The twirling of the uh, pool cue. I wanted nothing to do with him. Web. I couldn't stand anything about him. He was in early training for Last Samurai. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know what it is? He's that. He's the student that you've had that you've tried to show how to do something a thousand different ways, and they still refuse to try any of the ways you've shown them, and they still continue to make the same stupid mistakes over and over again. And you're just losing your patience. That's what it is. I, I'm with you, Jr. I couldn't stand him. I couldn't stand how insecure he was. I hated mm -hmm. how possessive he was over his girlfriend of over Carmen. I thought that was totally like effed up. Uh, I couldn't stand. I couldn't stand how like abrasive and loud he was. The fact that he wore a T-shirt with his name on it was fucking hilarious. I'll give him yeah. that. He worked at a kid's store. How crazy he looked, was that? But like, but he was a hell of a salesman. Uh, I just found myself. In all honesty, I, I, Mrs. Webster made that point. She's like, <clears throat> I'm not going to lie. She's like, Tom Cruise pretty much plays the same character in every movie where he's like that, like, oh, like I'm a quiet guy and I'm really unassuming, but I'm going to yell and scream at you like in five seconds and I'm going to go lose my mind and something bad's going to, like, I'm like, yeah, you're actually kind of right. Like he does do that. Like every single movie. I'm like. At least finally when he did something like Jack Reacher, it makes sense for him to yell and go crazy and everything else. I mean, like, <laughs> the whole time I kept thinking to myself, like, when's he going to yell, I want the truth? Like, the like, he hey, just, Web. he's that guy. And this is, you're right, prime Tom Cruise time. Webb, is up? he a salesman? He stole a jolly jumper to two sleep-deprived parents who just want the kid to like something. So I find <laughs> that coffee. I could sell anything to a parent at that age. Okay, I remember my son true. being that age. I sure I'll buy it. What is it? A thousand bucks? I don't care. Do I get to have a coffee? Well, get me an extra five, five wizard fingers quiet. on the way out on the hot dog. Roll. I'll grab five wizard fingers. I don't care. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I don't care. Use a little jolly jumper. Congratulations, sleep-deprived parents. Amazing. Wow, you're the man. Amazing. A creepy kid world store. Weirdo. Amazing. One, one thing yeah, I, got I don't know. I just I, I I'm with you. I, there wasn't a whole lot about him. I I no. enjoyed to be quite honest. James, sorry. One thing I got to mention though is uh, it it I didn't realize maybe until like maybe a few years ago when I watched this movie again <clears throat> that this movie was actually after Top Gun. And when you really think about it, like when you watch him in Top Gun, he's a lot. He's, he's, you know, he flies by the seat of his pants, but he's a lot more put together. Like, he's a lot... Yes. He plays a different character. He's a lot more, like, um, disciplined, you know, so to speak. More ch mature, that type of stuff. He's such a child in this one. He's just like a child. And the way that he played that character, how obnoxious and how childish he was, and even the way his hair was, he looked younger. Like, he even looked yeah. younger. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, whoa, like... This is after Top Gun, and he looks like this. Looks like it should be like six years before Top Gun. Like that's that's how much younger he seemed to me. Yeah, this guy's not taking down Mig Twenty Eights. No, he, he does he, have some ridiculous flow in this movie, though. Yeah, he's got some high top flow in this one. Yeah, he make, makes he needs to get every inch he can because I think he's only five eight, maybe in real life. But. He's not taking Polaroids and giving the finger with goose. I'll tell you that much. No. <laughs> no. Well, and I'm I'm exactly like you guys. I literally wanted to punch his lights out the entire movie, and I would have if I was in any of those pool halls. I wanted that guy with the hole in his neck literally to punch him out. Yes. But, uh, but that I yeah I think but I think he he acted the part perfectly. I thought he did an awesome job of being just an obnoxious loser that you wanted to just strangle. Yes, he did. Let's, yeah. let's yeah. move on to Carmen, played by Mary Elizabeth Mastrantonio. Okay, I don't know about you guys, but I thought of Tony Montana's sister as soon as I saw her. And then other than that, I thought she was great. Uh, I thought she was actually fantastic in this role. Uh, I enjoyed her. I liked her like learning of like Paul Newman. She was the student to Paul Newman. I she think was. the actual student. She learned the game from Paul Newman a little bit of how to do this. And when she saw 
uh, Fast Eddie there, uh, Paul Newman's character in uh, AC, and said, you know, you would be surprised how much Vincent's learned. You know, I could, she's trying to figure it out. And some of her quotes, some of her ideas, um, she's trying to try to make, make something out of this. She's a hustler. She's much more of a hustler than Vincent actually was. She has the mind of being a hustler. Vincent is the mind of, like we said, the seven-year-old. So I thought she was an excellent character. I thought she had an excellent job acting in this role, and she was fantastic to me, Webb. Yeah, I'm still trying to figure out if she actually like has, I'll say, feelings or is in love with Vincent. You know, like, or if she just sees him as a meal ticket. Like, I, I, I get the whole, uh, the, everything you said is 100% accurate. I just, I, I feel like that part of the, the story was never kind of fully explained. It makes, it makes it feel like that she thinks, I, I, I don't know, from my perspective, I thought she probably just thinks it's more of the meal ticket relationship and she's just maybe hanging on because she doesn't know what else to do. But there might be mm. some kind of feeling there. I don't Could know. Could it be a get out of jail ticket because you robbed his family? <laughs> I love, yeah, I mean, love her. potentially <laughs> the necklace. Yeah, the necklace. But like, yeah, she. I mean, uh, actress-wise, she did a great job, and I thought the character was. I, I don't know. It was pretty one-dimensional for me. There wasn't a whole lot there. I mean, she's she's neat, I guess. But yeah, I don't know. I think James she's really Gordon. important, though. I she think is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's she's important to Vincent's growth, right? Because. Yes. When we see, so sorry, yeah, to your point, yes. When we see that scene later on when he's playing, uh, where he's trying to hustle, I keep, I want to keep calling him Beans from The Sopranos, uh, the guy from Akron, where yeah, he, he gets, yeah. he could, it could have got him up to two grand, where he's like oh, mad at her yeah. that, like that scene there, I'm like, you know, okay, yeah, we see that Vincent is fully on, uh, now turned into Paul Newman, right? Like he's, yeah. he's made that final transition, so yeah, you see that aspect of it, but like, yeah. There was nothing about her that I, I particularly thought, like, wow, what a great human being this person is. She was a bit of a dirt ball to me. Yeah. She's in, and I think this is kind of, this is a Scorsese, uh, Scorsese thing as well. And it's also a tie in back to The Hustler. Everybody in the, in the movie from start to finish is opportunistic. They're all yeah. out, it, they're in it for themselves, they're all hustling somebody. And 100%, she's hustling. She's, she's opportunistic. Your hunter, I think you get your answer, Webb, when she has that heart-to-heart -heart with Paul Newman and she brings out the necklace and tells the story about the necklace and she's like, and he's like, oh, Vincent gave it to you? That's his mother's? And he, she's like, no, I got it from the robbery when we robbed Vincent's mother. He always says, my mother has one just like it. And that's kind of like her saying to him, like, you're using us, I'm using him, everybody's using somebody. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like we're all using it, everybody's opportunistic, and everybody's using somebody. And I saw a lot of parallels actually between, uh, just to uh, make reference to another great sports movie that we've done, uh, um, with White Men Can't Jump with uh, mm. Billy Hall Gloria and Gloria. Yeah, like yeah. I do believe there there is some genuine love there for sure. But you know they were both op opportunistic people as well. Like you know what I mean? They're all they're both everybody's trying to get out of whatever situation they're in. And, and just like Gloria, she would also be extremely frustrated that he c continues to not listen to guys like Fast right. Eddie and like, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fair point. Yeah, that yeah. is a good point, Jim. Let's move on to like other notical, notable, there's some great secondary character. Like those, another thing too, and I mean, this is old school directing and writing. You know, you get three main characters and then now you've got in a plethora of wicked secondary characters. So who are some of the other characters that jumped out for you guys? Well, do we... Uh, junior? We can go talk about Junior. Which one was Junior again, sorry? No, Toretto? Uh, what was that? Not Junior. Oh, um, um, oh Julian. Julian. Julian, I'm Julian. sorry. Julian. Sorry no, no, about no, no. that. Sorry, yeah. boys. Uh, Julian, that's a guy we can always talk about was that guy. I mean, the way he... Uh, just the whole shtick to him. He's a scumbag. He's the ultimate pool hall scumbag. Yeah. So I think that's one of those things where just this guy's an absolute scumbag. Everything yeah. about him. Coke fiend, scumbag. That we, I hated him too. Same thing. Yeah, absolutely. He was a great character. And I think we touched on Janelle, who was played by Helen Shaver. She's a great actress. Um, and the you guy, guys she was, who, she's, she's the Paul Newman's rock. She's, Fast Eddie's rock in it. And, and any time that he's kind of, you know, spiraling out or reverting to, you know, 
demons of his past she's always there to kind of ground him and and that's the key for his life is he's got he's got the love of that woman and she helps to ground him and i thought she did a great role a job in this way i love their the intro of this movie when they're talking about whiskey Mm -hmm. and and just their connection it was just awesome it was really cool i really liked that i like those scenes where they're just having this kind of nonsensical discussion about whiskey and but but it's a flirting and they're, they're having this connection and kind of building that for the movie she did a great job I was going to say, how about uh, Orvis? Bill Cobb's playing Orvis and Forrest Whitaker. Those both start, stood out to me. Yeah. So Orvis is the guy at Chalkies, just mm-hmm. like talking about staking. Uh, I was trying to look up his name here to remember what it was. Talking about like staking Fast Eddie and like basically just working the hustle with him. Like, and you just, you get that perspective where the house is in on it too, right? Like yeah. that was really cool. He's steering uh, them. Steering yeah, them. exactly. And then Forrest Whitaker, I just thought that was a hell of a cameo too, because he would have been. This would have been one of his like earlier roles, right? Yeah, like, what? It, it, I just remember sitting there seeing that and thinking to myself, like, "Holy shit, Forrest Whitaker's been around for a long time." Yeah, a lot of sh- a and, lot of credits for Whitaker. Him. Forrest Whitaker was a former Division One athlete. He was a full scholarship defensive end at I forget the school's California school. Anyway, uh, Forrest really good athlete. Certainly but- big enough. And, yeah, and Forrest guy. Whitaker, I loved his character in this. It was just the way he played it. Like you can see the potential in him as an actor, the way he played that role, his mannerisms, and the way he rolls off that last line when he's leaving. Hey, do you think I need to lose some weight? And and it's just such a it would piss you off so much if you're Paul Newman, right? You're just like it's a total know, fuck you. Just get out of here, you know what I mean? Like it's just he did an awesome job. He was great. His whole shtick, like that to me, that's where you see like the full on hustler right where he's going through like three to four different kind of like hustles that whole time right where he's talking about like the mental institute and mm-hmm. everything else and then going on and on like he's just got these different angles i'm like holy fuck this guy's a genius yeah and i'll just i'm gonna probably make note of this later but there's a lot of cameos from and we wouldn't really know them because well before our time but a lot of cameos of world-class billiards and snooker players and all that were in this movie they played they played a lot of cameos in it and they were obviously part of the um direction for consulting on scenes and stuff like that is we'll the main up. guy there that cruz plays is he a legit player grady grady seasons was legit uh, was, eh? that, that's not the actual name of the guy but yeah. grady Seasons is a made-up name but he was uh he was one of the top players in the world at the time cool okay. like, I, I love the banter back and forth in them it's like hey grady Great. Up your ass with the spot, <laughs> you know. <laughs> awesome. uh, let's jump into some quotes. Speaking of which, are there, uh, there's a lot of great quotes in this movie. I thought as well. Uh, are there some ones that stand out for you guys? Well, one web I had for you at the very, very start, Jamie you talked about talking about uh, scotch. That single malt made me think of Web right away. I was like, oh, yeah. that's Web. That's down that Web's wheelhouse right there. Yeah. Um, a couple of I had that. Uh, I leave with her in two minutes. That's still to me. I mentioned that earlier. That's one I had. Uh, where's the other one? Sorry. I get off a 10, not without me, you don't. I thought that was a pretty good Paul Newman line. Not without me, you don't. I like that. Um, there's a bunch I'll leave open. I'll put another one down. Was uh, It's a nightmare, isn't it? That was my one of my favorite lines of the whole movie. Was, just it's a nightmare, isn't it? It's a night- it just keeps getting worse. A nightmare, isn't it? Great. It's a nightmare, isn't it? I thought that was pretty good. I actually enjoyed the between those two. I thought that was pretty good. And then uh, there is the I make the omelets, Paul Newman. I love that line too. Oh, Almost, I made the omelets. What was in the omelets? I put this in there. I lied. That whole banter was fantastic to me. I wonder yeah. if it was scripted that way. I wonder if, how I, much of that was scripted. Or I feel like it almost was so authentic. It wasn't. Like okay. just like they just just run with it for thirty five seconds and like, well, what was in it? I don't know. Sweet sauce. The, the, the way they talked about it was awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I, just like, uh, I had uh, everybody's happy goes home in a limousine. That one yeah. made me laugh. Uh, uh, po- classic, like Paul Newman trying to like basically teach him uh, he should be the unknown. Like basically, yes. like enough of this already. Like this guy should be the unknown. Uh, you couldn't find big time if you had a road map. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Oh, and he's talking about how like the young guys all play when Paul Newman's going on his, his like get off my lawn. I'm an old man rant about basically nine ball being a, a, a young man's game and everything else. And he, for and bangers. he's talking, yeah, for bangers. And he's talking about like uh, how they're all coked up and everything else. All the young guys say, 
He's like, well, what? He's like, well, when I was young, it was all drinking. And he's like, well, you know, the, did the Bible say something? He goes, the Bible never said anything about amphetamines. I thought yeah. that was a pretty good line. <laughs> and then uh, money won is twice as sweet as money earned. Just a classic. That's, That's a famous a quote. One. Yeah, yeah, famous one from this one. I like the one, too, where uh, Tom, Cruise, Tom Cruise is playing, getting ready to play Moselle. And then mm. Moselle's like, he's got his case with him. And he's like, what do you got in there? And he's like, what, in here? And then he opens up the case and he looks down and he looks up and he goes, doom. I thought that was a pretty good line. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then, um, I mean, Eddie said this throughout the movie, but the balls roll funny for everyone, kiddo. Just calling people kiddo and stuff, too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Such a, such a, uh, like a, that era type of thing. Uh, <laughs> when Eddie, Eddie's like, driving down the street and uh, Vincent's pissed off and running away. And he's like, Vincent, get in the car. This is embarrassing. You're acting like some girl who got felt up at a drive. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So yeah, I, th- I thought there's a lot of like, you, there's a lot of good monologues. There's a lot of good monologues. In really there. good I, monologues. I can't get into like the monologues are just too long, but I just thought like when, you know, you get Paul Newman in a movie and he's talking he gets on some of his monologues there and he's talking about whiskeys and he's talking about pool and he's talking about different things. He's got some great monologues in this one anyway. So let's I jump. Found, oh, I sorry. was going to say, I found with that early one, JR, you were talking about with the scotch. I had a hard time hearing it and I don't know if it's, I'm just so used. To, it's the way that these movies were scored with the sound. Like yeah. I found, I don't know if you guys found it with the music. This. Kind of I had to go back. I had to come Oh back my and god. And like it felt yeah. like it just kept jumping. The volume kept jumping yeah. like crazy. I was like, am I just getting this old or is this like totally out of whack? No, no you were wrong with that. It's the way they were done. The quality wasn't as good on those sound. And sometimes the, the music would overpower it. <laughs> yeah, the, you see why so many movies are being remastered, right? Because you can't oh. hear squat. Yeah. And the, and in that scene where he's talking about the whiskeys and stuff, it's like and he's like a obviously like a second third rate salesman because he's talking about this whiskey that tastes like the name brands and you can wild turkey he's like <laughs> i get you some wild turkey labels to put on these bottles you know what i mean like it's just like <laughs> he's like yeah you can't tell the difference all right you don't even have to use iodine to change the color it's like you know what i mean like all that type of stuff that's hilarious uh let's jump into some little known facts so paul newman as i mentioned won the best actor oscar for this movie Overall, the film was nominated for three other Academy Awards, Best Supporting Actress for Mary Elizabeth Mastrantonio's role, Best Screenplay, and Best Art Direction. This movie is considered a sequel, as we mentioned, to the uh, an unofficial sequel to the 1961 hit The Hustler, which also starred Paul Newman as Fast Eddie Felsen, and, I, and Jackie Gleason as Minnesota Fats. Um, and both of these movies are based on books. So there was a, I don't know if those books were, I think they were connected because they're using the same characters, but um, in the novel that the this movie is actually based on, Fast Eddie plays in a tournament against uh, Minnesota Fats, which is played by Jackie Gleason. Uh, but Martin Scorsese uh, wanted to take the film in another direction. So in the original movie, The Hustler, Jackie Gleason is in that and they have Minnesota Fats, the character that's in that. Uh, but they decided they didn't want to have Minnesota Fats in this movie. They did think about trying to fit him in, in a way. But Paul Newman and, uh, and Jackie Gleason kind of kicked it around a few times, wrote a few different drafts of the script, and then they just felt the character didn't really fit into it, and they didn't want to take away from kind of Eddie's story of moving on. So they ended up cutting it all out all together. So uh, when The Hustler in 1961 first came out, the movie... There is an increase in the sales of pool tables, uh, and the film apparently caused the uh, popularization of pastimes of pool playing, and people were buying a lot of pool tables, putting them in their basements, so it really kind of jumped up, uh, all of that. And then there was a lull between uh, the mid-60s back until this time, and then when this movie was released, it kind of kicked that back up again, and all of a sudden the sales took off again. Um, I don't think we've really had uh, the other movie I really like with billiards is uh, Pool Hall Junkies, which was early two thousands. But I haven't, I can't movie. think of anything that's either been since then or even between this and the co- or that and the color. Uh, Uncle Phil hustling at the pool hall, maybe. Oh. Prince, that's about <laughs> all we got. <laughs> Crack out Lucille, there Jeffrey Brigo Lucille, and Soul Man's play. <laughs> anyway, so Soul that's Man. that's all I had. That's, no, yeah. you're not wrong, but that was about it. 
So uh, Tom Cruise, as, as always, he likes to kind of do his own work, his own like stunts and stuff like that. So apparently he put a lot of work in in uh, pool halls to get ready for this film. And he did a lot, most of his own shots. And I don't know if you guys could notice it, but when they did a lot of scenes where he's taking shots, they show kind of like the panned out view of him. You see him, you see the ball, you see the shot all in one one shot. Whereas a lot of other characters, like I think with Paul Newman, they did a lot of split shots where you see mm-hmm. him, kind of him behind the ball, and then you see, or you see his cue, but you, you don't see, see the face. effects. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They use different effects to show the shots. But Tom Cruise did most of his shots. The only one that he didn't do was when he did that double ball jump and he dropped yeah. the high ball. You remember that? that? Insane. Yes. Yeah. Like a slow mo shot too. It was like a sick shot. Really, and he was like wedged up against. It was it was a really difficult shot. So he was. That was one of the only ones that he didn't do. Uh, Martin Scorsese has said that this is the only film that he has directed that actually came on under schedule and under budget. Pretty interesting. <laughs> so after the last shot of Eddie and Vince's game at the tournament, Paul Newman had all the. Oh, I already mentioned this, but he he brought in uh, he brought in stacks of uh, Budweiser beer cases that we talked about and shared it with the cast and crew. So that's kind of as we mentioned earlier, that's why we wanted to break out the buds tonight in, in honor of Paul Newman and just the kind of guy that he was. You know what I was going to say, James, with that last point you made about Scorsese and the under under time and under budget or whatever? Yeah. I mean, when you think about the movie, right? It's not like they're they're waiting on ridiculous like sets or they're waiting on like you're not blowing things up or you're anything. not like, yeah, that's what I mean. Like it makes sense. Like there's no real violence in it. There's nothing like there's nothing in it that speaks to me that would be over budget or under time, like, or over time. No. Like your, your sets are all controlled because you're playing in a pool hall that you can just shut down. Like, and, and they didn't look like they were like, High end, like no. you, know, like, no. you know where you're going. You're going to Utica. You're going to Utica. You're going to film a couple streets in Utica. Grab the greasiest <laughs> pool hall you can find and yeah. shut it down for a week. Okay, exactly. Yeah. This is, <laughs> yeah. You could definitely shoot this on a low budget, no doubt. No yeah. doubt. Um, so, legendary video game developers John Carmack and John Romero revealed that this film, especially the exchange between Vincent and Moselle, was the source of the title of the hit video game, Doom. I thought that was pretty wild. What? They lit, cause that Doom, Doom was a huge game. That, that was, was a big game. Massive. So they Doom lit- was the Fortnite before Fortnite. Yeah. yeah. So they literally got the name of the video game because of this movie when uh, Vincent opens his case and says Doom. That's, that's pretty funny. Wow. That's crazy. So... This is the only Scorsese film that Rod, Roger Ebert did not review favorably. So he didn't give this one a good review at all. It, overall, it got good reviews, but Ebert was not happy, didn't like it. And I, I did actually read his review, and his, his biggest critique was that it wasn't that he didn't like the movies as much, but it was that um, it didn't have the same... It, it kind of deviated from Scorsese's typical... Uh, like you kind of like you said, Webb, like more of kind of like a violence, more of a dramatic uh, crisis, uh, mm-hmm. that type of thing. So it there's just not as much char- there's not as much character development in this one, I find. Yeah, to be quite honest with you. Yeah, usually Scorsese films too. Yeah, they they there's usually a much more of a build up to something as well, and this one kind of, you know, it's it doesn't have that kind of. Uh, culmination into some type of a, you know, the the epic peak of the movie, so to speak. It just kind of there's this one. I felt it was like more more of a roller coaster, whereas like there's 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 little little peaks and valleys throughout it, mm-hmm. and and then leading up to the end, like it, it's more of a redemption story, really, for Fast Eddie, if anything. But mm-hmm. yeah, so I think that's what Ebert was. He, his critique was more like this didn't. We didn't get out of Scorsese what we expect from Scorsese, so to speak. It, it didn't fit the, his regular motif. So the film cast includes three Oscar winners with Paul Newman, Forrest Whitaker, and Martin Scorsese. Um, and three Oscar nominees, Tom Cruise, Richard Price, who was the writer on the film, and Mary Elizabeth Mastrantonio. Has Tom Cruise seriously never won an Oscar? Oh. Yeah, I was surprised just when you said that. I was like, he's never... like. He's, Magnolias he's, or any of those movies? None of those? Nothing? What was the one he did with... Uh, yeah, what was Sky? the one he did? No, Magnolia? Yeah, I was going to say... 
What's the one where he plays like the, uh, is it Magnolia? Mystic where River? Like, Was he in Mystic River? No, no, he's not in Mystic River. No? Okay. No. No, no, but Magnolia, is that the one where he's like the like um, TV infomercial guy, for lack of a better term? I can't remember what it, like, uh, oh, what That one's I, with uh, Kidman, wasn't it? Steel Magnolia? I've... I got no. them all mixed up. No, oh, that's no. Eyes Wide Shut. That's Eyes Wide Shut. Like, no, yeah, no, no. It's the one. I, I can't remember what it is. Anyways, I'll have to find it. But yeah, I, that's kind of surprising to me. Yeah. So during a weekend, just in the middle of production, Paul Newman brought Tom Cruise to a, a car race because Newman owned uh, the racing team. Newman. Newman Haas. Is it Newman Newman Haas. Haas. Yeah, yeah. Paul Tracy. Team Canada. Yeah. Right. Uh he, he, so he kind of got Tom Cruise hooked on car racing during this movie. So he brought him out to a couple races. Uh, Cruise loved it. And this exhilarating outing put the wheels in motion for Cruise to begin putting the pieces together for Days of Thunder. So yeah. everyone, can thank, you can thank Paul Newman for Days of Thunder as well. He created Cold Trickle. He sure did. That's awesome. Absolutely. <laughs> so let's jump into our realism review. What was realistic for you? What was uh, missed the mark? Well, uh, in the billiard world, I don't know much other than like maybe, you know, eating wings and shooting some stick. Uh, I don't know a lot about it, so I'm not going to dive ripping into it. Yeah, ripping some sand. <laughs> <laughs> Pushing that little red light to get more beer brought to my table. Like, I don't know what to say. Um, well, a couple things I can chime on is we referenced it earlier is kind of the greasy pool halls. I thought they did a really good job of the few pool halls I've been in of just representing like the greasy, greasy pool hall atmosphere, um, culture of it, what you see, what you hear, the look, the idea of the game being played, the hustle always going on, uh, the pool hall owner being in on it. I think that's pretty cool. And I think that seems very real to me that somebody's always got hands in things. And I think it goes back to Jamie, you talked about the hustle movie where everybody's in on, on the take so to speak. Um, so some of the things I had was the lifestyle. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, I thought that was pretty real to me. I mean, people who are really into billiards can doubt that. That's fine. From my take, that seems very legitimate. Uh, some of the fake stuff I had was, we've talked about this before, but like social media be all over this guy today on all the moves they do and this guy where you've seen him, what he's doing. I feel like, maybe you guys disagree, but I feel like in modern day times, some of the fake stuff would be this hustle. Like, would it work? Would word of mouth have caught up to you? I always feel like that when they talk about between here and AC is this many miles, this many pool halls. I feel like word of mouth would catch up in the phone call oh, and, stuff and said, watch out for a, you know the white Cadillac. But that's me being nitpicky and just trying to look for something in the segment, too. I know that. Fellas. Yeah, there was so, no Twitter back then, so I'm getting away with it. There's yeah. No TikTok. Like, no TikTok. There's no, Six. There's no TikToks, there's no Twitters, there's no instant messages, there's uh, the, there's no iPhones, there's nothing. So, would it ha I don't know. Probably would it. I don't might know. Might get a Gordon Gecko, like, Zach seven, pound, phone. seven pound uh, car phone in 86, but that's about it. <laughs> yeah, so would it be going on? Maybe. I, yeah, that was one of those things I just kind of thought through my head, but I'm not sure. But those are some of my things. I don't have a lot. I I mean... I think the thing that was realistic to me was the fact that uh, Vincent would be so dumb and so reluctant to learn the, the ways. Like, he just doesn't strike me as an overly intelligent guy, to be quite honest. Um, that was, like, the biggest thing. Other than that, I don't really have much more to add than you. My, my level of uh, billiards and snooker or any of those other games is very, very limited. Uh, other than I've played it and used to be half decent when I was younger, but now can't play for shit because my eyesight's terrible. But uh, yeah, I, I don't know. In terms of pool halls, same things. They've always been dark and dungy. My parents always told me to stay away from them when I was younger. So, you know, uh, I don't know. I got nothing to add in that front. Sorry, James. No, I think the fact that when they put this movie together, they went out and got a lot of the leading money leaders on the on the circuit to be advisors on the film and to have cameos in the film. So I think a lot of that is done really well. I thought the scenes were shot well. The pool scenes were shot well. I thought the, as you mentioned, JR, the grittiness of the towns and the, the you know, going through the Midwest, playing all these backroom pool halls, things like that. I thought that was all really well done. One of the things I thought was kind of interesting and there's a little bit of foreshadowing was um, Vincent talking about Stalker. 
And he's like, <laughs> pool's easy. That's nothing but stalker. Like the video game, right? He's like, that's the future. We're talking reflexes. We're talking, yeah. you know, electronics and uh, tanks that are run by, you know, remote. I mean, that really did become a thing, right? Like that. But it's funny you say that because, like, the point he makes is like, yeah, I'm going to get really good at this and then join the military, right? Like, that's like yeah. the whole the whole thing of like, yeah, I'm just, I don't know what else I'm going to do with my life. I'm going to join the military. Yeah. Yeah. There's not a lot of like the ceiling ceiling for some of these guys is it, even like when they're talking about winning big money, they're talking about going in and winning like, like a couple grand on a weekend. Like yeah. you could, you know, maybe just try and put your focus into it. That, that shows you the stage in life where people are though and where they're at. It's like, they don't have the option to go to university and try 80s, to- 80s inflation, baby. Yeah, absolutely. So um, it's in the rush. You know what I do? Sorry, you know what I, you know what I wanted to bring up because I actually think it's kind of funny because I've noticed it in the last. I'll say the older movies that we do. I want to start playing a game now. Every time we do like an older, I'll say like eighties to night. How many movies we do that have a scene with a burning trash can going on? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like Rocky. there's always fucking like guys yeah, that are like guys. half homeless. <laughs> like I'm like, where are these all these burning trash cans coming from? Like that's, I've that's, never been anywhere where I'm walking around seeing burning trash cans happening. I'm sorry. That's an American city thing, though. A big city like America. Like they're just everywhere. Yeah. Burn Every barrels. Single town. Urban barrels just happening everywhere. Burn barrels everywhere. That's funny. everywhere. That yeah. is what it is. Every '80s movie's you got can, some shout out to a burn that, barrel. Though, like Chicago and New York, you'll get that stuff in those back, those down so by the burn barrel, like that. Yep. Keep warm. <laughs> um, hilarious. Let's. Let's jump into the soundtrack. So the music was composed by Robbie Robertson. So Robertson's a Canadian songwriter and composer. He's known for his collaborations with Martin Scorsese, including uh, Raging Bull, Casino, The Departed, The Wolf of Wall Street, and The Irishman. Robertson was inducted into Canada's Walk of Fame in 2003. This is, what do you guys think of this? This is actually one of my favorite soundtracks. I love this soundtrack. What are your guys' thoughts on it? Yeah, I'm going to let Webb run with this one. But yeah, Jamer, same with you. I thought it was a wicked soundtrack. I love just like the bar tunes going on uh, all the time in the background, the bar music. Uh, I can't. I agree with you, James. This soundtrack's unreal, Webb. I'm going to let you go. But I was going to say, Robbie Robertson, for those of you who don't know, has written probably one of the best, I'll say, summer campfire or cottage tunes of all time right when he was with the band and he wrote the weight like i don't know about you guys right. but like yep. that song comes on you're never changing it like nope. there's certain yeah. songs that'll come on and you're like okay yeah whatever that song comes on you're always gonna sit there and listen to because it it's such a great song so just this stuff with the band his his catalog is so deep what i found was really neat doing a little bit of a deep dive into this particular movie was so he his his management was basically pissed that he took time off from recording his album to like make this soundtrack. And so they basically said, you can't appear on anywhere on the soundtrack. So he basically went out and got like all his friends and people that he wanted to work with yeah. to like just be guests on this. And they all ended up like recording songs for it. So like uh, Warren Zevon, and, uh, sorry, I'm going to pronounce it, Zevon uh, yeah. and like Werewolves of London, like all these tracks he had clapped in on there. He had like all these guys. He just was like, oh, okay, well, fuck you then. And I'm going to just have all these guys come play. And he ended up playing instruments on all these songs, but not actually doing any uh, vocals or recording. So he's still getting paid off this stuff. He's, just getting, he's not getting vocal money for it, uh, which I thought was fantastic. Uh, yeah. But yeah, it, it's just, he's such a cool dude. Great Canadian kid. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I got nothing but love for this soundtrack. It's amazing. Yeah, I agree. Well, well said. Yeah, unbelievable. Like, there's just like I usually I'll I'll usually like download some of the songs that we're doing each week, and like I've probably got a six or seven songs that are now on my playlist because of this movie, and they're wicked. Like, who owns this place? Don Henley. Like, it's mm-hmm. in the way that you use it. The Clapton song, uh, Robert Palmer's on this soundtrack. BB King, yeah. like, Warren Zevon, Werewolves in London. Like, there's just. It, it's endless it's just it, and they're really well timed tunes in the thing like when he's when it's werewolves in london and he's like acting like a jackass though but when he perfect. does that scene where yeah. he runs his hands through his hair and he's like yeah. his hair was perfect and all that stuff like and the just, cool thing well i was gonna say I was, I was telling jr before we got rolling i was doing a bit of a i got into a youtube wormhole on warren zevon clips 
and I was watching his very last. So tragic story for those of you who don't know about Warren Zevon, like mm -hmm. guy very much in a lot of ways, like a, a precursor kind of like to, I'll say Gord Downey. And I'm only saying this because I was listening to the newest release, tragically hip stuff earlier tonight too. Yep. Um, but anyways, long story short, never went to the doctor. His life was complaining about shortness of breath, ended up basically having lung cancer and, and declared terminal. Yeah. Um, and like died within like a little bit, a little bit more than a year. He outlived his, his, uh, uh, diagnosis or his prognosis anyways was on david letterman all the time one of the coolest clips i've seen uh him on david letterman his last appearance on david letterman he used to fill in for paul shaver all the time but he's basically talking about uh dying and just his perspective on dying in life and how he talks about it it was just so cool it was hilarious it was just like he was this guy like now when we talk about guys you want to sit down and have a beer with he might be one of, he might make my top four it was just so cool listening awesome. to him. And I'm like, this cool. guy needs to have a little bit more uh, credit. And he's got a – Rolling Stone has a great article out, uh, about him, and it's called The Art of Dying. Uh, so if you get a chance, go out and read it. It's fantastic. Awesome. That's cool. Yeah, cool. fantastic. Let's do a little movie wrap-up. Where does this one rank among all-time sports movies for you guys? So in the fringe category – um, I'm going to put it pretty high, though. I can't go wrong with the Tom Cruise and Paul Newman, and Paul Newman helps carry this one for me. So I think, and I really, again, I haven't seen it in a long time, but I really enjoy this movie. So I'm going to put it in the top five of the fringe sports movies for me because of the characters in it. Uh, the story, it's something I don't know much about, so I find it kind of intriguing, too, if that makes kind of sense. Like, I don't, I learn a lot about this. So... I'm going pretty high at it. Top five, uh, definitely for me, guys. I'm going to go with uh, my boy Roger Ebert on this one. It's not my uh, – it kills me to say that because you guys know how much I love Scorsese. I even, I'm one of the few that really like The Irishman. Um, <laughs> love but, The Irishman. Yeah, but a lot of people I, – I actually thought this movie was too long. I, I thought it was about a half hour longer than it needed to be. Um, and – Despite having, you know, Tom Cruise and Paul Newman, like we got like probably two of the heaviest hitters you can have all time. Um, it just, I don't know. There's something about this movie. I found it really slow. I found it kind of boring at points rewatching it again. I just, I don't know if I'll ever rewatch it again. I would, I, I mean, I guess I would if I was stuck with no other options, I'd watch it. But yeah, I don't, it doesn't rank high for me. I'm going to, I'm not, I, get, I don't even know if I'll get a rewatch again. So I can't put it. In a fringe movie, either it's not going to go in the top ten, top twenty. I don't know where I'd put it. To be quite honest, all time, it's not making my top hundred. Sorry, and I'm I'm on the other end of the spectrum with this one. I really love this movie, and it is one that I, I just love. Like, I love bar sports. I love pool. I love darts. You're okay at darts. But this yeah. is the thing: you can't. <laughs> I, I won't call. It, I won't call it a sport because you're drinking beer. Yeah, or you're well, drinking. Yeah. Period. Right? It's golf. <laughs> golf is an activity. It's one I really enjoy. It's not. Yeah. I won't call it a sport if I'm drinking beer and playing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean, so but this one for me had just so many things that check boxes for me. It had Paul Newman. Love Paul Newman. I uh, love '80s Cruise. The music was just awesome for me. I love the grittiness. I love the, you know, the whole the way it's shot. I, I I'm a Scorsese fan too. So there was that aspect of it. I really like The Hustler as well. But this, when we talk about movies where, like, I know it's an unofficial sequel, but it's a sequel. Um, this movie, to me, the sequel's better than the original for me. So I, and I like the fact that it can stand on its own as a sequel. Like, pe people could sit, could watch this movie and never know that another movie existed. Mm -hmm. that, like that Major League Two. Right. <laughs> like, like you said, you like me. Not a chance. <laughs> Be quiet. <laughs> Uh, I don't agree with that, but but um, a and and you know I love that there was like some really good secondary characters that kind of blossomed into great actors through this. Like there's John Turturro, there's um, as we mentioned Forrest Whitaker, uh, you know. So I just there's just a lot of things that checks for me. It's very nostalgic for me. It's one. It actually is one that I usually try and watch once every couple years or so. Uh, so I actually have it really high. I actually have it. All time sports movies at six, number six. That's pretty high. So, anyway. Wow. Yeah. I'm, really? You I'm up there. Six is all time sports movies? Six. 
Yeah. Oh, I don't even have it in a sports movie. Yeah. Sorry, like I, I don't really. Know. Oh God, ever, fair yeah, enough. You know what? Nothing wrong with that. You are, checks a lot of boxes for me. Check listener, well. listeners, Jamer loves Paul Newman. I, I don't know what else to say. He <laughs> does love Paul Newman. There's nothing wrong with loving Paul Newman. Newman. He's well, he's in my favorite. Human. We'll get into that at some point, but I'm not. Yeah, gonna... he's in your what? He's in my favorite all-time movie too. So I'm not. Yeah, gonna... he's in yeah. the top one of I think a lot yeah. of. You're, he's in 101 for Jamer. Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. Well, fair enough let's that. let's jump into our draft. We had a we had a tricky tricky time putting together a draft this week because it's a very challenging movie to put a draft together for for what we typically try to do um and this one came down to the wire we just kind of actually came up with the last minute well this week's draft's going to be uh because because we have john turturro in this movie and this guy's been in like so many great movies playing a lot of variety of different characters he's got a wide spectrum of things he could do very talented guy we're going to have best john turturro movies so a little shout out to John Turturro. He got his start, one of his early mo- starts in this movie. Um, so let's do, uh, let's do. We're a talking draft. best John Turturro roles, not movies he's in, right? Well, I mean, yeah, just roles in movies. Okay, roles. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Well, I, well, I'm yeah. just saying movies because I, I've got a couple on my list where he's in the movie, but yeah, it's roles, I guess. But. Okay, yeah. Because the movie, I, I, I went roles, so it might be a terrible movie, but he's great in it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally, totally. Okay. You can do it that. Way. Right. Um, I think I do have first pick this week, so I'm going to start out with one. This is going to be a pretty obvious one, but uh, and nobody fucks with the Jesus. I'm going with <laughs> Jesus Quintana from The Big Lebowski. John Turturro okay. plays uh, uh, Jesus enough. Quintana, who's uh, I forget uh, what is uh, John. What's John Goodman's? Do you remember his name in that movie? Big Lebowski. Oh, with oh the God. yellow glasses and the guns. Yeah. Oh my God! I forget his name, but anyways, he's he's their rival. <laughs> yeah, he's their he big rival. But he, he comes is. out. He's got the he's got the ball cleaner, and him and the guy. Someone are, can tell us that. I've drawn a blank on it too. What a movie, though. He calls him on the line, uh, foot over the line fault. He's just hilarious in that movie. That he plays Jesus, Jesus Quintana. Nobody that's fucks with Jesus. Anyway, that's, that's first. All right, so I think I have second this week. Then. Yep. I believe. Yeah. So. Okay. So, well, okay, so I'm going to actually go with uh, Emilio from Mr. Deeds. Don't okay. underestimate the sneakiness. I have to go with Emilio from Mr. Deeds. When you put that, like, uh, fire thing through my foot, don't worry about it. I, I howled at that. That's a Hawaiian punch. <laughs> okay, so that's my <laughs> first one, Web. I got to go with that guy. Nice Class. pick. Nice pick. Uh, okay, I'm going uh, three. I'm going with uh, Kanish from Rounders. Ooh, Ooh good nice. Pick, Lo- love him, uh, love him as Kanish in, in Rounders. Where he's uh, having the steams, uh, and he's got he's always got Matt Damon on the payroll as the truck mm-hmm. if he needs it. Yeah, uh, and then I'm going uh, my next pick. I'm going uh, Billy, Coach Billy Sunday from nice. We Got Game. <laughs> nice, <laughs> totally unbelievable. But I thought it was hilarious, so I'm going with Billy Sunday. Yeah, nice. remember we had a show when we did that movie. Webb and I yeah. didn't like Jr. You loved that coach. I didn't. I it love yet. that. Coach. Totally unbelievable. Totally, hundred um, percent. Okay, so I'm gonna come back with. Jeez, uh, I'm gonna leave one for you, Jaber. I wanted to keep this one for you because this you do some great quotes on this one. Uh, I'm gonna come back from uh, Don't. Uh, sorry, uh, where was it? Oh, brother, we're out thou, Pete. Oh yeah. And Old Brother were out that he was fantastic. And that movie's yeah, got a great was. soundtrack. Speaking of soundtrack, great soundtrack, amazing Corpus soundtrack. Movie's soundtrack unreal. So I'm going yeah. Pete, Oh Brother, Where Out Thou? Uh, where Art Thou? Sorry. And uh, yeah, I enjoyed that movie quite a bit. My wife and I probably watch that movie at least once a year. And he's great in that role. That's a great movie. Coen Brother classic. Pete oh, yeah. Hog Wallop. Yeah. Yeah. Classic. I think I know what you left out for me. I'm, I'm very I thankful. I had to. Here. I had to. With this pick, I got to go with uh, uh, Chuck from Anger Management. <laughs> I got you, buddy. I got you on that one. Oh, the voices, the screams. Oh, were you in Dom? <laughs> no, Grenada. Didn't that last <laughs> 11 hours? Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Love Chuck and Anger Management. That's one of my low key favorite movies, is Anger Management. Love That's that a, you know what? That, that is a sneaky. What that is a sneaky one of Sandler's best movies. Great People, movie. I think yes. that movie is totally unappreciated for how good it is. It's a great movie. 
But when you think of Sandler movies, it doesn't probably yeah. make your top five. When he's when he's mm-hmm. losing his mind on the guy, and then he gets in his face and he goes, "Goose Fraba." Yeah. <laughs> 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 Amazing. Amazing. <laughs> Unreal. Love that movie. Just beat the uh, shit out of Monk. He shouldn't have been talking shit. <laughs> <laughs> I feel pretty. <laughs> oh, so, pretty. <laughs> um, so I've got another one now. Oh, yeah. I'm torn. I'm so torn between these two movies. One of them I'm going to give a shout out later anyway. I'm going to go with this one. Because um, he ended up being in nine Spike Lee movies. Mm-hmm. He became a regular in Spike Lee's group of guys. But this was the movie that put him on the map. This was the movie that put him on Spike Lee's map. Because they actually had a scene in Do the Right Thing where John Turturro plays Pino. So yeah. he had a scene with uh, Danny Aiello, who's a legend, R.I.P. Yeah. Um, and they had this scene where they're sitting in a coffee shop window and they kind of go at each other in it. And it's, it was totally ad lib. Apparently there was like a script, but they kind of went off the script and just kind of fed off each other and had this wicked scene and like Spike Lee was like blown away by it and loved it. Uh, and Ice Cube later sampled it in his uh, one of uh, Pino's rants in his 1990 song Turn Off the Radio uh, because the movie is so good to throw ended up getting on Spike Lee's radar and being in nine more films with him. So I'm going to go with Do the Right Thing. Good tech. Pino. All right, Jamer. So I gave you a free one then you mowed my grass on Pino. That's okay. So <laughs> No, uh, my next one, is, my last one is, uh, it's actually a documentary. I don't know if you guys have ever seen it. It's called uh, Derek Jeter, A Yankee First. And he's the narrator in this documentary. Oh, really? Yeah. And I feel like John Tra- uh, does a really good job. Like, he's pure New York. And if you want somebody, there's a lot of people in New York who can do a narrator of Derek Jeter and a Derek Jeter documentary. But I just feel like he hit, there's something about him that's just New York. And you pretty feel like, yes. yeah, it's pretty Yeah, it is very pretty Bronx. And it makes it, va- it validates uh, this documentary on Derek Cheater. So nice. I'm going to go with that as a narrator role. Um, yeah, that's it. All right. Uh, hmm, what do I got left? So I know I should say Raging Bull, cause I, but I can't remember him that well from it. So I know I got to rewatch it. Uh, I'm going to go with uh, Transformers. He's pretty friggin' hilarious. Is like the FBI guy or whatever yeah, he is. Yeah. The Simmons guy. Yeah, Simmons. Yeah. Uh, thank he's you. Really I'm going with Transformers for my last one. He's pretty funny in it. Uh, really and he's funny just in that. he's just like got like that ridiculous. He play. I mean, he plays the bumbling idiot really, really well. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, I'm going with Transformers for my last one. Good pick, nice. Jr. You just remembered me, and I didn't even have this on my radar, but uh, you just reminded me about uh, with talking about the Yankees. So, I don't know if you guys saw this series. I think it's an ESPN series, but it was back in like the 2000s, early 2000s, called The Bronx is Burning. Yeah. It was about, it was about mm-hmm. that. Isn't that a 30 for 30? Uh, this one's actually a mini series, the one okay, that this that's one has. I'm thinking. But I think there is a 30 for 30. And it's on like, the, I think it was like the 1977 Yankees. It was when they brought like Reggie Jackson over and they had a lot of like crazy personalities. But they ended up winning. I think they went on the run. But um, like Billy Martin, Ron played... Guidry. That's Ron Guidry, Thurman Munson, yeah, Reggie yeah. Jackson, oh, Willie Randolph, Goose. all those kind of guys. Goose Gossage, yeah, yeah. that's, that's their big boys. Studs. They were studs. They had a team full mm-hmm. of studs. But uh, John Turturro played uh, Billy Martin in the, in the series. He did a really good oh, job. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah, really he'd be good. fantastic, Billy Martin, because you have to be so fiery to play Billy Martin. Another shout out I had uh, this movie, and this was actually one of his very first, very first movies that he did from nineteen. It was nineteen eighty four. It was the Flamingo Kid. He played Ted from Pinkies in it, so it was uh, like a shitty comedy from the eighties. Like Gary Marshall uh, directed it. It was uh, Matt Dillon was like the star in it. But one of the cool oh, wow. things, the one of the reasons I wanted to bring this movie up was, is there was uh, the love interest. Matt Dillon's love interest in the movie was none other than Janet Jones. Ooh. Oh, Mrs. Gretzky. Mrs. Gretzky. Yeah. Ew. And she's an absolute smoke show in this one. And she has like a big role where she's like a main character. Like she talk, like, you know what I mean? Like she's been in like Police Academy 5 where she didn't, you know, it was kind of down. But this one, she has like a big role in it. And also, it was one of John Turturro's first roles. And it was also, I think, Marissa Tomei's either first role or one of her first roles. And it, she has a small bit role as well. 
but yeah, just nice. shout out. You know what was a good uh, movie was, uh, I don't know if you guys have ever seen it. It might have been TV. I'm not sure. It was called Monday Night Mayhem, and he plays Howard Cosell. Oh, yes. Yeah, that movie I just was saw that. I don't know. What the, I, like, I haven't seen the movie, but I just saw the credit yeah, for it. I was really like, what? good. Yeah, that movie is awesome. And the dad from Home Alone plays the uh, what, the ABC exec, whatever. And okay. who heard, I think, I believe his name was. John and Hurt. He, John yeah. Turturro strikes me as it would, he would have a hard time doing the Cosell voice. He crushed it. Really? Yes. He, he can find it. it. He yeah. really changed his voice around. He's good. And his body language of Howard Cosell, like he hunched his shoulders over yeah. and he's like, oh, I'm Howard Cosell. And they have like the Ali piece with Howard Cosell because Ali and Cosell, that dynamic was amazing. They were, they were really tight. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And they would pretend it was like they, they were amazing together. Cosell, but I mean, like, I think the thing that's surprising, like, Cosell and Turturro both have very distinct, unique voices, right? So yeah, for, mm-hmm. for Turturro to be able to kind of, like, mimic that that well would be would be impressive. But you know what was crazy between them was the base of their voice is actually similar. Yeah, yeah. okay, I can see Turturro that. Turturro just slows down in his Howard Cosell, like, yeah, yeah. the champion is here, like that, the way... Cosell yeah. would talk. He That's slows true. right down to the do it. The bass is the same. You're not going to get Gilbert Godfrey to play Howard Cosell. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Howard! No, anyway, sorry. Sorry, listeners. <laughs> uh, That's enough of that. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. It wouldn't be, it wouldn't be a, an episode without a Gilbert Godfrey reference. Jeez. We get a few of those. Yeah. <laughs> Guys, bro. Where the hell's up, Web? All right. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Engage with us on social. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and leave us a review. Please continue to engage with us on Twitter at Big League Flicks and on Instagram at Big League Flicks Pod. You can also check us out on TikTok. Uh, and don't forget to check us out on YouTube as well. Just give a search for Big League Flicks. Take care, everybody. Have Take a great weekend. Mistakes. Cheers. Talking movies about sports and the glitz and the glamour. Got a cold beer pairing for the leading lady staring. Fun facts and trivia and man rocket comparing. Soundtracks and music, they'll rate all these things. Was it real or did they lose us as the fat lady sings? Talking junk, have a giggle. Comedy, drama, romance. Did the film deliver six to noon in my pants? With their big bag of tricks, these podcast critics. Jordan Christian and Jamma with Big League Flicks. Jordan Christian and Jamma with Big League Flicks. Jordan Christian and Jamma with Big League Flicks.